Coming up on the Nesson Bruins podcast, we talk about what happened in Columbus. Tuka Rask getting hurt and the Bruins' response or lack thereof. We also look at Brett Ritchie going on waivers and try to decide once again what's wrong with the Bruins. Play the music. Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, wherever you're listening to this. Welcome to Nesson Bruins Podcast. I'm Nesson.com's Mike Cole, joined, as always, by Logan Mullen. Logan, how are we? I'm all right, Mike. How are you? Uh, not bad. Always a pleasure to see you. Always ta- nice to talk hockey with you. Oh, yeah. Uh, which is a pleasantry, uh, which is uh, really just for pleasantry's sake, because some days I don't really feel like talking to you, but I still do yeah. it anyway. Well, that's nice. Of How you. is that? That's, yeah, that that's is an honestly, dude, it's smashing upfront, stuff. Honestly. No, I don't. I don't blame you. But uh, we don't see well, each other nothing, as often yes, anymore either. True. So you probably actually, have a bit more of a, I, I, a palate for speaking with me now because it's not me whipping around every ten minutes, being like, "Hey, Mike, just a thought about the Panthers." I cherish so, these opportunities. It's very uh, sweet now. of you. Um, anyway, so we're here to talk about the Bruins as we do every week, and uh, once again, it's uh, we we meet under uh, some questionable circumstances for the Bruins. Uh, sure. It looked like they had turned things around, three wins uh, in the last week or, or so. Yeah, actually, the three wins in the last week, uh, beating Nashville. It, that was the whole thing, right? The moms turned the season around. Did you hear the yeah. Bruins have moms? I don't they know do. Yeah. Everybody's mentioned I've that. I've been told. Uh, and they, uh, they turned it around with an impressive win at Nashville. Uh, they came home, beat Winnipeg, uh, and then beat the Islanders in overtime. And it looked like everything was... a nice was, three-game run. Right, yeah. yeah. It looked like everything was solved. Uh, going in the right direction again, and then they came out. And I know we say this every game, every week. It seems like they had probably their worst loss of the season. Yeah, uh, what was like it? time number five. They've had their worst. Loss I know. Of the year. Monday night in Philadelphia, up five to two against the Flyers, and just melted. And, and this is my. It comes back to my point last week. Uh, you know, maybe you wouldn't suck so bad in the shootout if you stopped, or maybe you wouldn't have to suck so bad in the shootout if you stopped giving up late leads like they did uh, in that game as well. And then they lost in the shootout with the Brad Marchand gaff being uh, the Brad Marchand gaff being a huge gif yeah. all over the <laughs> internet as he became the uh, laughing stock of the interwebs and shot back with a uh, an interesting move of him posting a, a photo with the Stanley Cup through yeah. his social medias, which is. Uh, like I said, interesting. Uh, and then uh, most recently Tuesday night, the Bruins uh, just blanked in Columbus, a game that I guess. Uh, it was the first time they've been shot out all season. I guess it, there was some uh, positivity from that. I, I feel like Bruce Cassidy was uh, lukewarm at, at best in his, his praise of his team for, for having yeah. a solid compete level. I didn't see it, really. I just thought it was kind of maybe they just weren't the better team. Maybe they are tired. Uh, whatever. We can get to all of this uh, very soon yeah. uh, at some point. But... Let's start with what I think is the big story. I think it's the most interesting story that we've had in a long while with the Bruins. And it does stem from that Columbus game where uh, early in the first period, uh, you, you know, you lose your goalie. Tuka Rask, uh, the victim of a, uh, I was going to say, a vicious blindsided <laughs> uh, hit. But uh, it, it was, uh, we can sit here and debate whether or not uh, Emil Bemstrom meant to, to knock Tuka Rask in the head. Regardless, the end result was a concussion for Rask. He missed the rest of the game. Uh, and that's pretty much where it ended, and maybe yeah. that's the problem. A lot of people getting on the Bruins for the lack of response. Uh, what say you on that matter? Well, so I don't blame them for not responding in the first period because judging by what a lot of them said after the game, the Bruins, that is, I don't think they and had any clue what happened. And when you listen to what Carlo said, because Carlo is the one that technically – Push Bemstrom through Rask's yeah. crease, right? He asked the ref, and the ref told him it was just a stick, a stick. to the face. Yeah. So if the referee was that far off, and if you go back and look at the the replay, the way the play was situated was the puck was in Tory Krug's skates, and he was facing opposite of Rask, and everybody was looking at the puck, right. so nobody would have seen that coming. Yeah, and I mean maybe a few guys on the benches might have seen it, but I don't think there was a big idea of what happened so I don't blame them for not doing anything in the first period after that it you could tell there was a shift in the second period like I think some people are overstating the lack of a response from uh, the Bruins but here's my thing you cannot force a guy to fight that is not the nature of the NHL especially a guy like Emil Bemstrom who has never been known to fight um, is still trying to find his way in the he's NHL. He's a 20-year-old. Yeah, he's a 20-year-old who just came to North America this season. 
Um, so when Brandon Carlo, because Brandon Carlo said that he challenged him, um, and that Bemstrom said no. At that point, there's not much you can do because Carlo has, without looking at it, probably five or six inches on him and probably a good amount of weight as well. But when Nordstrom challenged him, that's when, if you're Bemstrom, you kind of have to take your medicine. Like, even if he thinks it truly was incidental, make what you will of the hit itself. And you can think that the code is barbaric and antiquated and stupid that even if it's an accent, you have to answer for that stuff. Whatever. Yeah, it, right. It, it, it might very well be stupid, but it exists, right? And so you kind of have to treat it as such. And so the fact that the Bruins really didn't make him or anyone else answer for that as a problem. So when Vemstrom backed off from Nordstrom and made clear he didn't want to do anything, and it turned into that scrum where I think Nordstrom got an unsportsmanlike and then Pierre-Luc Dubois got a roughing, at that point, somebody should have from the Bruins said, all right, well, we're fighting Dubois or we're fighting whoever from Columbus that will actually go. Um, But just kind of leaving it at that uh, is a little bit, I don't know, Tuka Rask deserved better. Yeah, I wrote about this on Nesson.com Tuesday morning. Uh, I, I don't disagree with really much of any of what you said, which doesn't make for a great podcast, but... Uh, there was one point that I already forget, so that's a, a great start by me. Um, it's just a tough spot. Like, I, I, it's a it's an unfortunate situation with less than desirable results for the Bruins because you lose your goalie, you lose the game, and you didn't get to you know get your pound of flesh. Right. Um, and they tried, and I will give them that. I'll, I'll, I will say that they. I do think they tried. Carlo, yeah. there's. I remember because. I'll be honest with you, I didn't see much of the first period, and then I saw the tweets and stuff and flipped over, and I was like, I'm sticking with this game the rest of the way through to watch and see if this thing turns into an absolute gong show, and it didn't. But every time uh, Bemstrom was on the ice, I had my eye on him, and there was one time where Carlo went after him, uh, and he tried to shove him into the boards and yeah. get him to go. Uh, Toy Krug cross-checked him in the back behind the play, trying to get him, you know, get his gander up. And then, uh, and then, yeah, Nordstrom after the play. Uh, and Bemstrom said after the game that they were going after him the entire night, which I think is probably a bit of an overstatement. Yeah. Um, but I guess that bodes well for if you want to give the Bruins a check mark in, in, trying, in terms of trying to make this happen. But into your all the points that you made, if you know, if the guy isn't going to drop his glove, if drop his gloves, you, get, you have one of two options, right? You do nothing, which mm-hmm. is what the Bruins did, or you goon it up in a way that's going to get you, you know at least a fine probably a suspension you know what are you going to do you're going to blindside the guy you're going to take liberties with him you're going to just sucker punch him i mean we've seen recently that these types of things don't go unnoticed by the department of player safety uh so you're going to sit it doesn't help the team they can't really afford to lose anybody right now with the way that they're playing right uh so there's a, a long list going against that and there was that one you know the nuclear option if you really Wanted to get carried away is that's going out going after you know the opponent's goalie because right. Bruce Cassidy mentioned that in his post game press conference is that in those situations he said skill for skill you know if you go after mm-hmm. one of our skill players we're gonna go after yours so if you go after yeah. Patrice Bergeron we're gonna go after you know your first line center or whoever you want to say probably Dubois well right? I was gonna say so, I, as I started saying fight. it I was like I guess so, it's a it's an imperfect run into an issue uh, I mean uh, Seth Jones uh, Zach Warensky you know Matthew that. Shane in a previous year yeah. like that type of <laughs> Bring Panarin back. Uh, right, yeah, Panarin. Yeah, that's the <laughs> Panarin thing. Panarin would fight, though. Panarin and McAvoy sure. fought twice. Yeah, that's true. Um, so you do that. That's what you do. You know, you you go after one of theirs. But when it's a goalie, it's a much trickier thing. And I yeah. do think if you want to have one complaint, and maybe Cassie got at this, maybe I'm reading way too much into what he said, but he said that he wasn't necessarily pleased with how much traffic they got in front mm-hmm. uh, of the Columbus net Tuesday night. I don't want to put words in his mouth and saying like him being like that. Well, we could have gone after him that way, but hey, you know, I feel like they could have made life a little bit more difficult yeah. uh, uh, for uh, how do you say uh, uh, Merz like Leakins? Yeah. yeah. So well, if my memory Elvis. serves correct, I believe Tortorella said after the game that he was pretty happy with how clear they kept the front of the sure. net. Um, I mean, and, and, and it wasn't in direct reference to the response, but it was something he pointed out. Um, and yeah, I mean, I and I do think too. A lot of this is 
era based you know and I, yeah. this is something i wrote this is the lead of my story this morning was like you know this is not the same nhl it was 10 years ago it isn't even the same nhl it was five years ago no. and if you go back and look at the way the game was played then it's vastly different even in that short period of time you want to go back 20 years it looks like an entirely different sport these are just things that don't happen as much there's not as much uh emphasis or uh reliance or expectability if i can make up a word on on somebody like you know to to answer the bell if they have a questionable hit and i think that is you know i don't want to get in the, the the fighting debate but i do understand when you see things like this happen why people believe there still should be fighting in hockey because you know, if we take Ben Schrambert as his word and say that this was accidental, imagine what he could have done if he wanted to and then yeah. still wouldn't have had to answer for, answer for it. So I get that there's that part of it, but it's just you can't run around like you used to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, challenging guys to fights. There's not as much on, the onus on the player to, you know, to oblige. And, and that's kind of just where the Bruins are at right now. Yeah, and, I think, situation. It, and I think it is tough for players to navigate now especially yeah, right. ones that have been around for a while like you think about chara and how long he's been around i mean what have chara's fights been lately i mean the yakov trenin one in nashville that was because he just watched mac right. pasted right in front of him uh and he responded that way but yeah this going back 20 minutes later and going after a guy who had a suspect hit earlier in the game like I think guys are, especially guys with histories, are afraid to go and do that because they don't want to get bagged by the Department of Player Safety yep. for two, three games or whatever it is. You look at Chara's three fights this year. I just I was curious. It was the the Nashville fight. Then he fought he fought Pat Maroon, Pat Maroon and, and Wilson. Tom Wilson on back to back right. nights. Both of those, you know, Tom Wilson is Tom Wilson. In yeah. Maroon, there was plenty of leftovers from the Cup final. Yeah. So. That's, those are both understandable. It makes sense. Um, yeah, that's it is, and I mean we're I mean we've already trended in and you know way away from fighting in the NHL. I think yeah. we're what how I mean how many fighting majors are we going to have this year and what how many more years until we're down to what ten? Right. I think we're going that direction. Yeah, for it'll, better or worse, it'll be rare, right? And it's the same thing with the whole code thing, right? And that you have to answer for stuff deliberate Which is or not. So it's primitive, like, if you yeah, think, right. Yeah. It's all primitive. It's all very antiquated. But for now, it exists. Yeah. And so when I and I wrote about Tortorella's comments about it, where he basically said like the league's not the same as it used to be, but he thought it was good for Bemstrom to have to kind of deal with being mm -hmm. targeted and. I don't know if this is specifically at the Bruins. I mean, this might be reading into it too much. But Tortorella was chuckling, talking about it. And I think it was because he probably knew that the Bruins didn't do as much as they could and chalk it up to, you know, being worried about getting punished by the league or whatever it is. But they could have done more. Yeah. And you even have, I mean, the Blue Jackets Twitter account, basically. I know. That was a Bruins, weird tweet. Which, I mean, whatever. You want to talk about Twitter accounts, it is what it is. Um, and, yeah, I guess just... I, I do, and I actually, I want to go on record because I called the code primitive. I, maybe I'm primitive. I'm a, you know, I'm a Neanderthal. I still like it. I like that it exists. I like that hockey, or fighting in hockey exists, uh, which is a, uh, a conflicting admission to make because I understand now more than ever the, the you know I mean even yeah, yeah it's uh, you know imperfect uh, comparison but Luke Keekley just retired right of concussions and such and it's it's understandable but um, I just railroaded myself with my own thought there uh, it it's one of those things where I I do think it's I don't know if it's necessarily uh, needed but i understand why it exists and i think that's the one thing that people forget when they start uh criticizing fighting in hockey and criticizing the code and, and all of that is that uh it's easy for you to say that from thousands of miles away watching in your living room and, and tweeting it out or writing your column or whatever but like that's a fast game on the ice between competitive men who are you know f trying to all occupy the same space of ice yeah. you know in a, in a contained space with boards on your left and boards on your right and you're playing on ice and it's just it's a very dangerous thing i think emotions run high and that's to be expected i think that kind of gets lost and like in a perfect world there wouldn't be fighting in hockey and there wouldn't be you know guys being dinks about it but right. it just kind of is what it is yeah i kind of like where fighting's at right now because i think there that's are fair. very few guys 
in the league right now whose job is just a fight. Like the days of you know, I'm talking yeah, about right. the league changing. Like well, that, the days of guys like John Scott yep. having a, a, getting in the lineup even somewhat regularly are pretty much gone. Yep. Um, and so you look. I mean, some of the guys we mentioned today, Pierre Luc Dubois, he'll fight. He's got. 34 points this year. Tom Wilson right. still plays top line yep. minutes. Like some guys can do both. And so that's, I think that's kind of where there's this big divide among the fan base where it's like, you know, do the Bruins need an enforcer? Not what I think a lot of people believe they need. I think people think they need a, it's even unfair to loop like Adam McQuaid into that group because yeah. Adam McQuaid can play, but like a John Scott type or someone whose job was pretty much no, I mean, just a fight. You, you need someone that can do both and those guys aren't everywhere and you can't really blame guys either for not wanting to fight like you know are you really going to subject a 35 year old david backus who has a demonstrated history of head injuries to that like think about it from a human perspective right it's just it's fighting as it stands now is probably in the best possible place it's going to be in the league without being gone uh-huh. altogether yeah uh we'll have to work on it for next week or coming up soon to try to get somebody on to talk to because i am very interested to to get the opinion either of a current player or a former player about how they look at that and then good luck finding uh, a current player to go on record about that i feel <laughs> like it's it's a hot button topic for that but maybe somebody who's seen it somebody who was in it mm-hmm. recently relatively recently and yeah. kind of sees it from from afar now uh but it is i think it's one of the more interesting debates in sports really is because it's such a at its core it's such a i don't want to <laughs> put my foot in my mouth it's it's not something to idolize or, or be in awe of, but uh-huh. I do think there is part of it where it's like, that's kind of neat how that works. <laughs> right. It's I don't know. It's, again, there's no way to sound like, uh, to, to enjoy it without sounding like you're dragging your knuckles on the floor behind you. Right. But um, I do think there's one uh, interesting theory coming out of it, and it leads us into our second topic. Uh, the Bruins placed Brett Ritchie on waivers uh, Wednesday afternoon uh, for the... Uh, purpose of demoting him basically is that yep. uh, what it was um and there were i did see some people saying well yeah. if, if richie had helped r- respond uh tuesday night in columbus he wouldn't have gotten put on waivers uh i'm guessing you do not buy into that theory so as a whole i do not however so you think it was the final well here's the thing is so i i don't think it helped him i'll put it this way i i don't think him not doing anything last night helped him and the reason i can to a degree see the other side is because pretty much since the Nashville game, Brett Ritchie has played pretty well. Yeah. The last week or so, he's been all right. The only reason he got scratched against Winnipeg last week was so that Bacchus could get in during the mom's trip. But otherwise, Ritchie has looked okay. And so for him to get sort of abruptly sent down, I guess, says to me, well, that couldn't have helped his case because the timing is interesting because – they, it's not like they made a trade and they have an immediate answer for someone yeah, to go on gonna, that third uh, line right wing. Like they, that was the most productivity they've gotten out of Richie or Bacchus or whoever in that spot this season in terms of the guys cycling through there. And so for them to send Richie down right away, especially with the timing, I can't help but think, okay, maybe it had a, a slight bit to do with it, the fact they didn't respond against Columbus, but at the same time, if that's what you're basing your rationale on, it's silly. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's not a whole lot to add there either. Uh, I, I guess it will be interesting and maybe telling, to your point, what they do uh, to fill that roster spot. Well, it's Because so if they bring up Trent Frederick, then it's like, well, maybe there is something to the, the Richie theory. I think the more likely move is maybe, you know, a Carson Kuhlman type of move where I don't know if you're trying to bring some more energy to, to inject into a team that's kind of been lacking it lately. I don't know where they go from here, but what do you think? So my thought is that I believe I'm trying to figure it out right now. Cause I don't want to misspeak here. Um, but they have Anton bleed on oh, yeah. a, uh, I believe a one way contract. And because he started the season on IR, he was never moved off the NHL roster. Um, so, yeah, he started – he was on a conditioning loan um, to Providence since beginning the season on IR. Yep. He's still technically on injured reserve. Now, 
January 13th was when his condition, his long-term injury conditioning loan ended. So in order for them to activate bleed, unless they plan on subjecting him to waivers, because he's going to need waivers to go down to Providence, my thought is they might give him one last look at that spot. And I think he's a left shot, so they'd have Heinen probably move to right. the right wing, and you go with bleed, coil, and Heinen as your third line. You give a guy you spent a 2013 sixth-round draft pick on one more look um, and see if maybe you get something out of him, at least give him a chance to prove himself before you just put him on waivers. Sure. So I think we might... He's a left shot, but... He is. Um, I think we might see for like a week an Anton Bleed experience, mm. uh, experiment. Mm. That's my only guess. Because if you're going to have to send him down anyways, you might as well see what he looks like yeah. and just make sure. I mean, they, they saw him for 19 games three seasons ago in 2016-17. Um, but you might as well just see what's there. Sure. Uh, any other thoughts on Brett Ritchie, just uh, the Brett Ritchie, Ritchie uh, experience, as, as it were? I don't want to sound like I'm a Brett Ritchie apologist here. You are, though. It sounds like you are. I just, I never understood what the problem was with him. I'll, I think he was set up to fail right away because he had that 16 goal season a few years ago. And that was really a hammering point for a lot of people in the media as well. Maybe this is what they're looking for. And I think he was put in a bad spot, especially because he was floated as an option for that second line role, where it's just, that's not the type of player that he is. And so when it became clear he wasn't going to put up, you know, 14, 15, 16 goals again, he ended up getting just essentially trashed by the fan base. So we talked about this probably a couple months ago that it's like, why are we getting worked up over Brett Ritchie? Like if your season's hinging on him, that means there are issues in other areas. So he, you know, I thought there are a few times that he looked like he really didn't have much jump. He didn't do what he was brought in to do, which is at least defend and play a somewhat heavier game. He just he looked lost every now and again. But I I didn't understand why so many people just detested him so much. Yeah, eh, I'm just looking. Through I mean, for it. Christ's sake, it's Brett Ritchie. That's a good. It's a fair point. It's. I. I don't disagree. I'm not saying either. he shouldn't be on waivers, and that he probably. I mean, there was no, a reason I mean, the Dallas Stars were healthy scratching him like the entire back half of last season. But the, that's what the Bruins probably within the organization were probably expecting. If I had to take a guess, and I think that there is just a perception on the outside that maybe he'll be more than he's actually capable of being. Yeah, I mean, if this wasn't a. Uh, a weekly podcast about a team that was winning 90% of its game for 75% of the season, we wouldn't have talked about Brett Ritchie as much yeah. as we have. It's just kind of you run out of things to talk about. Uh, and so that's, yeah. Um, we'll see. You know, I don't know. They, I, I feel like at this point, it, it's almost at the end of it's the I guess it's the middle of January right now, and they still haven't figured it out. I think this is going to be a dance that they do at least until the deadline, and then yeah. probably even after that if they don't do anything at the deadline, which seems likely that it could be a quiet deadline. So I don't know. Yeah, I think the hope for the Bruins is that York actually works out on the second line because then you start looking at guys through a different lens, right? Yeah. So Carson Kuhlman and Zach Sanishin probably become a lot more palatable as your third line right wing than your second line right wing. So I think they're kind of crossing their fingers that that happens. And a guy that you're going to it's probably easier to trade for I was guys say, that you're you envision looking, playing on your third line. You're looking second. at your own players and external options differently and things like that so all right uh anything else you want to talk about just with this where this team's at right now a, a pretty big weekend coming up too uh they have a home and home with the penguins uh a weird a random home and home a thursday sunday the rare thursday sunday home and home uh that's uh i guess i mean we this we talked about this last week where they're in the midst of the teeth of their schedule right yeah, now. Yeah, it's a tough run up until uh, the all at least break. until the all-star break and it starts up right again after the all-star break so what do you want to see from the Bruins this weekend uh, to get you feeling positive against them about them moving forward? It would be nice to see them close out games better. I feel like too that's, often, I mean, that, yeah, that's, that's and so that's true. such a simple thing. But like they, 
when they get ahead, it seems like it, once they have a one or two goal lead, their goal is just to like weather a storm. Like it's, I felt like earlier in the season, they were content to run the score up on some teams. And now it's like, okay, we have a one or two goal lead. We're going to like hump, hunker down. And it seems like they're just playing in survival mode, yeah. essentially. Which is weird. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting point because like, the, the Philly game, I thought, was a pretty good example of that. They scored the five goals in what felt like... Yeah, it was quick. It ten felt, minutes, yeah. and then it was just a race to 60, and it just wasn't going to, you know... That's a not, not a great way to play hockey. No. Uh, you know, so that's a... You're putting yourself in that tough spot where it's like... It's it's too... I mean, there, there are impressive bursts, but there's too few stretches of sustainably... They're sustainably strong hockey it's mm-hmm. you know what i mean like they look really good for you know five ten minutes here and there and they did it actually they did it tuesday night in columbus where they looked really good midway through the second period mm-hmm. and that was about it for them that entire game they didn't get that goal and it feels like they kind of shrunk after uh you know after the second period which in part i understand they're playing back to back so that's that's partially responsible but it's just one of those things where they, yeah, the sixty-minute thing is such a is so elusive for them right now that it's yeah that's gonna you know that starts to show itself up. Well, and Halak has not been playing great either, so not they really all. can't. Again, back earlier in the season, there were times where they just left their goalies out to dry yep. and said best of luck, and it ended up working out fine because both were playing well. But if you've got Halak as your top goalie, if Rask mix, misses any sort of time. And you've got Legasse, who's played well in the AHL, but he's backing up. Like, you can't just hang hang your goalies out to dry. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I don't know, they, again, full 60 minutes. It's probably all that they can really ask for. Do you have any, uh, any read on the recent uh, attitude or perceived attitude from uh, Bruce Cassidy toward his team? It feels like my read on it is he's getting a little fed up, which it's about time. Uh, yeah. or, I mean... Not about I, I. He's got a better feel of how he wants to press his team's buttons. But I thought after the Philly game, he hung them out to dry as, as strongly and as stiffly as he has all year. Yeah, I mean, I feel like with Cassidy, you pretty much always know where he stands. True, and he's but he's I, okay at incorporating nuance I, into things. Yeah, I think he's that's uh, that's a good way of putting but, it. Is there was a, not a lot of nuance after the Philly game, right? And so I think that here's. Here's what will be interesting to watch. So say they continue to struggle during this tough stretch to have to give these full 60-minute efforts. He's always been so quick to change lines and shake up the lineup. I wonder if when things really start getting tough, if he's going to get carried away with that. Mm. Like he benched Matt Grizzlick against uh, the Blue Jackets because he didn't like what he did against the Flyers. And, hey, that's what Stephen Kampfer's there for. You know, Stephen Kampfer does a fine enough job. But is he going to start trying to send too big of messages? I mean, I know the fan base is divided on Danton Heinen. I thought it was a little much to healthy scratch Danton Heinen the other week. Uh-huh. Um, so at a certain point, it's like, well, is your message going to get through if you're just healthy scratching guys, basically at the expense of your team? Mm-hmm. Um, so, I don't know. It's a tough time. Uh if, as a coach, I mean, you see this across the league in a lot of places, and we're seeing it in Vegas play out right now where yeah. the message doesn't necessarily get stale, but you have to find new ways to present it, I think. And and maybe that's – maybe there's a built-in excuse here for Cassidy and the Bruins where this team really isn't concerned about January, February, and March, yeah. um, which is not a great way. And it's hard to turn on – you know, turn it around at the end of the year if that's going to be your attitude toward it. But I do think he has to kind of tread lightly with how hard he pushes these guys and, mm-hmm. you know, where he pushes down on the gas and where he kind of lets off and, and puts it back in a neutral yeah. because, you know, this is – I can't imagine that's a very happy locker room right now. No, it, it does seem – it's tough, though. I mean, the last time I was in that locker room was a week ago, Thursday, after the win against the Jets. Yeah. And that was a good win, and the moms were in the locker room, and the vibe was really right. good. So I feel like they are okay at not getting too high or low, given the particular yeah. moment and having a bit broader view of things. But I think there have been so many examples now of just these listless performances and letting games get away from them, especially games that shouldn't get away from them. You look at the 
lost to the Devils on New Year's Eve. Right. And so I think at a certain point, everyone just gets a little fed up with that. It is interesting to see what kind of motivational tactics perhaps he if he has a bag of tricks. Uh, and, yeah. You know, I, I think, you know, I, I joke about the moms thing, but, like, I think that was a nice way to kind of refresh mm-hmm. the, the vibe around the team and kind of give you a hard reset in the middle of the season where yeah. it's a little different. So maybe they, they experiment with some things, but they got to figure it out because it's just – it's been – I mean, we're going on, what, a month, month and a half of just relatively uninspired play yeah. from a team that we expected. And they and they can't just limp to the All-Star break. I mean, because Tampa's Tampa hot within 10 on the trail. Now, and, yep. you know, Toronto might fade out with the Morgan Riley stuff now. Yep. But still, I mean, Toronto or uh, Tampa's not that far off. So no. they, they've they effectively wiped away the cushion that they had. My prediction is that the Bruins will – or the Lightning will usurp the Bruins for first place in the Atlantic Division at some point uh, before the season is over. Yeah, I'm not saying. Do you think? They'll... Do you think they finish? No, the... I'm not sure, but I do think that there's going to be a point where you know I, this is going to be a two-team race down the stretch where yeah. it's going to be: did the Bruins win, and what did Tampa do? I think we're going to be doing some scoreboard watching down the stretch where. You know, you and I talked about this foolishly three weeks ago. Say, declared it over. Uh, I am now here to say that I would like a do-over on that. <laughs> this thing is far from over. So. Um, well, it, and I don't think they would want to deliberately get the second seed, but you might find yourself in a far more advantageous position playing as the second seed in the Atlantic than the first and getting one of the wild card teams and getting. Carolina or yeah. you, Philly after yeah, what Philly true, just yeah. did to the Bruins so probably rather a banged up Toronto team that had to limp to the finish or a Florida team with suspect goaltending all season even though we know what Bobrovsky did last year mm-hmm. so I don't think they would deliberately want the second seed but things have typically gone well for the Bruins the last few seasons hosting a first round series against Toronto as the second seed in the Atlantic already spinning it yeah Big time spin zone. I'm a company guy. <laughs> okay. Uh, I am too, but it's time for me to go home. So yeah. uh, I think we're done talking about the Bruins. Okay. Uh, this has been a delight. Uh, it's always nice to catch up with you. And Thank we'll you. do it again next week. I miss you. I miss you too. <laughs> uh, that's the Nesson Bruins podcast. We'll be back again next week to discuss all things black and gold. Goodbye.